I'm here today with Mario Gabelli, who's the chairman and CEO of Gabelli Asset Management, or GAMCO. So Mario, you coined the phrase private market value. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. It's a important because back in the 1970s when I started in business, the headline on magazines like Business Week was the death of equities. And individuals, uh, by the way, stocks were selling at three, four, five times even a cash flow. And because I was following broadcasters, I understood the notion of capital, how you could project out companies with very de minimis cash flow, CapEx. So we came up with the idea that individuals would want to buy businesses companies would want to buy businesses. And so what was a business worth that was publicly traded if it went private? So it was the private market value. And we did that in part out of necessity to convince individuals and companies and pensions to invest in the stock market again. Interest rates at that time, by the way, were, you know, I think in 1981, I bought a 10% 10 uh, 10-year government bond. It was 14.78. Today it's 220. But second part, was we had no tenure with our client's money. So we had to come back and say, okay, look, we're going to find good businesses at a cheap discount with a margin of safety, and we're going to calculate the private market value as to what they're worth. But we also came up with a catalyst. What element that is public information would indicate that that spread between the public price and the private market value would narrow? So we coined and trademarked the phrase PMV with a catalyst. So private market value with a catalyst, and the Columbia Graduate School of Business has put that into their uh, academic literature and gave us full credit for that. Well, let me ask you this. In terms of uh, investing now, and you look at the hedge funds out there, a lot of these guys were strictly focused on uh, public equities. Now you're seeing a lot of these uh, hedge funds, uh, and obviously the VCs as well, but investing in the Airbnbs of the world, uh, the Twitters of the world, um, uh, the Ubers, et cetera, uh, because they can get much better returns on their investments. Do you have any sort of thoughts on that? We, we are primarily in the public markets. However, back about 30 years ago, we were in venture capital investing. So that you, when you do venture capital, you have angels. That is really early stage. You have seed capital, and you progress up to first stage, third stage, late stage. Pre-IPO investing has always been around. We have not historically done that because our client base just wants us to buy public securities. However, you can do it personally. S secondly, uh, uh, private equity in the 1960s was called bootstrap financing. In the 80s, it was called LBOs. Today, it's PE, private equity. And there you can put, and so we were in both of those businesses. And so when we analyze a company, one of the elements that we look for that's public and take it private, what is the private market value of a public company? And that PMV, which we come up, and I'll go into why in, in the late 70s, uh, really deals with what is a company worth? Mm -hmm. If I was a private equity firm, whether I am uh, Henry Kravis or Schwartzman or the Carlisle or Cerberus or whoever, what would they pay and why? And how do they gather assets and what are their returns? So the notion of the flavor of the decade of pre-buying you know, there are companies that we know in Amsterdam that are extraordinarily well managed, and they have a database on every deal that's ever been done in a private equity, and sometimes it's liquidity and somebody wants to sell it. Mm -hmm. There are companies that, you, like you mentioned, the Airbnb and, and so on. What is the valuation? Can we sell it in the public markets? How do we own a return? How far along are we? So uh, there are a lot of ways to make money. And there are a lot of ways to lose money. Uh, Mario, on a completely different topic, um, when you look at America today and you look at the uh, cost of education, uh, you look at Social Security, you look at uh, medical costs, uh, which are skyrocketing, what do you think, what are your thoughts, and how do you think we're going to address these issues? And are you concerned? The American consumer has a balance sheet that is $98 trillion of net worth at the end of March, when it was the last numbers we had. They have a $13 billion, a trillion dollar debt. Okay, so their net worth is at an all-time high consisting of real estate back up, financial assets up. However, and that $13 trillion of debt, it's getting, the one problem we have is a trillion dollars yeah. of student loans. And we have basically created a problem in the educational system. And you, I'm on the board at Boston College, Roger Williams, Columbia Business School, and several other organizations that I have my fingerprints on, that I understand the cost structure has risen. 
beyond inflation. They're passing it through as tuition and giving discounts. We have to solve this problem of getting people an option on education and make it affordable. And then when they do have this debt, which is on, some of it was self-inflicted, like taking a semester off and going to Europe and running up a bill on that, that's kind of silly. But uh, by and large, 85%, maybe we should allow a tax deduction for your tu tuition and pay your, the loans back on a pre-tax basis, out of pre-tax dollars. There are a lot of things that can be done that have to be done. I am concerned about all of those, he health care and medical. Our mortality tables now have us up four more years to a higher life expectancy. It's just changed. Mm -hmm. The IOUs that we owe, in part because of the, pre uh, uh, the interest rates where they are, is another challenge. Uh, so we are, uh, unfortunately, with all of our problems, or fortunately, we're the, uh, the best of all the worst places in the world to be in, other than, let's say, Zurich or somewhere in the Fiji Islands. So, Mario, in terms of giving back, I know you serve on a ton of boards and that you've been extremely philanthropic. Tell us a little bit about your views there. So, because I was able to cobble together my tuition for high school, college, and graduate school from a variety of grants, that to me is an, a, uh, an important way to give back. So, we give money to kids going from grammar school to high school, high school to college, college to graduate school. And that is an important part of our family's foundation. And part of what we want to do is to emulate what Bill Gates and Warren Buffett have done through their, uh, uh, their in, in encouragement of others that have made money to give it back over time to whatever cause they want. And uh, we we're, uh, wholeheartedly endorse that philosophy and that, pro that premise. Let me ask you one last question, okay? You're back at Columbia, you're back at Fordham, and you're giving advice to the kids out there today. Uh, what should they expect? What words of wisdom would you uh, impart on them? Well, there's a lot of ways to succeed in life, okay? And having a, uh, the best education and be the best at what you're doing is clearly an important element. And within that framework, if you're looking to accumulate capital, <laughs> it's not complicated. The rest of the world is smart. You're smart. Just continue to focus and have a passion for what you do. Figure out what you like doing, but then do it from five to nine not nine to five. Secondly, instead of having one latte a day, put that money in a bank and watch how we can grow over the, if you're 22 coming out of school and you wanted to have 44 years later at the age of 66, compound this, that one latte a day that you don't have and have a, a K-cup that you can buy for, at Costco for 19, or 40, uh, 44 cents or, and give up one beer yeah. And look at how much money after tax you will have saved in your account if you can grow at 4%, 6%, and 8%. Just run the numbers. Once you run those numbers over 44 years of compounding at that rate of that amount you put in per week, you will become not only an important saver, but you will have incredible optionality and flexibility in your, in your life, independent of whatever you do in all of your other businesses. Well, to give up that one beer might be a little tough. I might have to figure out something else where to cut back. It is what it is. You don't give up cigarettes anymore because that's long gone. And, uh, you know, that Cuban cigar you're thinking about, it, uh, it's got to be given. You know, you just forget it. There, there you go. There you go. Again, I'm here with Mario Gabelli, uh, who is the head of Gamco. Uh, and, Mario, cannot thank you enough for your time today. Really, really, really appreciate it. Well, great questions and great insights into the world of finance and how to uh, look at various optionalities. Thank you so much. Thank you.